Welcome everybody to this second event in the new series, Ceasing Now on the Russia-Ukraine War. My name is Ben Noble, I'm Associate Professor of Russian Politics at UCL Cease, and I'm the coordinator of the Ceasing Now series. The purpose of Ceasing Now events is to discuss current developing issues in the Cease region, to help members of the media, policy and academic communities, as well as the general public to understand what's going on. We do this by bringing together an expert set of panelists to present their thoughts before opening up to questions from the audience. Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February this year has already resulted in large scale destruction and suffering. It has also profoundly shaken knowledge in the subjects studied at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, from politics and society to languages and culture, and from economics and business to history. This event brings together members of the CIS community working on the Russia-Ukraine war to provide their latest assessment, as well as their practical activities and broader research expertise. I'm delighted to present the following panelists in the order that they will speak. Dr. Aglaya Snetkov is lecturer in the international politics of Russia. Dr. Pete Duncan is honorary associate professor. Dr. Dave Dalton recently completed his PhD on the political economy of Ukraine at CIS. Bogdana Kurilo is PhD candidate at CIS with a project on critical security theory in relation to protest in Ukraine and Poland. Dr. Agnieszka Kubal is lecturer in sociology. Ada Wordsworth is CIS alumna and currently an MPhil student at the University of Oxford, and she's currently on the Polish-Ukrainian border. Dr. Michal Muraski is lecturer in critical area studies, and he's also currently on the Polish-Ukrainian border. Dr. William Blacker is associate professor in the comparative culture of Russian in Eastern Europe. And last but not least, Ursula Willy is PhD candidate at CIS with a project on regional responses in Ukraine to Russian government history propaganda. Each speaker will have up to five minutes to provide a quick overview of their thoughts, and these will be clustered into three groups. First, an update on recent developments on the ground and a discussion of the causes of the invasion and the ongoing war. Second, the impact of and responses to the invasion, looking at a number of areas, including Ukrainian resistance to the invasion, the refugee crisis, and the cultural dimensions of the conflict, including the destructive impact on Ukrainian cities, how the war is playing out in Russian public culture, and perceptions of the Russian rhetoric of quote unquote denazification. Finally, we'll look at peace negotiations, including what the identity of Russian representatives in those talks tells us about Moscow's approach to Ukrainian history, politics, and language. We have nine speakers, so that should take a maximum of 45 minutes before we move to Q&A. We're running this event as a Zoom webinar, so please use the Q&A box to submit a question at any point, rather than putting your question in the chat where it may be lost. Finally, the session is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the CIS YouTube channel very soon after the event. So without further ado, let me hand over to our first speaker, Dr. Aglaya Snetkov. Aglaya, over to you. So I was going to say uh, thank you, Ben, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for everyone for attending. I am Dr. Aglaya Snetkov. Um, my field of research and expertise is Russian security and um, Russia's wars. Um, and so my sort of brief for tonight was to give a very brief um, overview of kind of where we're at now with the war, but also sort of any of the ideas or sort of take takeaway messages that um, would be helpful to start off the discussion. So I'm very conscious that anything I say is fairly broad at this point, but I will be also very happy to answer any specific questions um, about the sort of the war in Ukraine. So reflecting and sort of looking at, you know, where are we at um, over a month now into the conflict, a number of things, obviously, a number of conclusions we can already sort of begin to make about the nature of the war, where we're at, but also what we can say about um, our understanding of this war and conflict um, and the way perhaps that it's actually different from the way development was shaped up in 2014. So as an analyst of Russian security, um, Obviously, if we're looking sort of at the beginning of the war um, and the Russia's decision to um, invade Ukraine at the end of February, 
you, we have to be conscious of the fact that there was a sort of the long tail um, and the fact that the crisis was building up since last spring. So analysts already started big, uh, talking about the um, concerns, questions, and sort of the tensions between uh, the Russian side, but also NATO and Ukraine, the building up of Russian troops on the border of Ukraine back sort of last spring. So this is a much longer crisis than something that just happened at the end of February. Um, it was also sort of suggested that having not made many progress in terms of sort of trying to, uh, to push for Minsk to uh, last spring, um, that Putin kind of needed a victory or needed to come away with something this time around, having started the build up of the troops back sort of in the late autumn, sort of December, November, December time. And therefore there were real concerns about the fact that the pressure on um, the negotiation, on the on negotiators of the uh, multiple sides, the question regarding Minsk too, were perhaps, you know, real. Uh, but most analysts, despite the very real buildup of troops on the border, sort of were hoping that this was a pressure tactic rather than um, the Putin regime actually sort of being um, prepared to wage war in Ukraine. As it turns out, of course, um, this was absolutely the, um, the rationale of the Putin regime. And looking back, I think most analysts would accept that the Russian side were hoping and expecting a sort of a quick victory, um, maybe not as quick as a sort of the eight day war um, or five day war in 2008 against Georgia, but nonetheless to be able to gain and create sort of quick realities and victories on the ground um, in order to, to induce um, pressure on the President Zelensky's administration. Now, personally, I think that uh, there's been a lot of talk about the sort of the question of rationality with uh, President Putin and the Putin regime. I think when we're looking at analyzing the conflict, rather than thinking about whether or not, you know, Putin is a rational man in waging this war and conflict, I think it's more helpful to think of it much more in terms of sort of the culminations of different logics from Putin's previous camp military campaigns, whether we're talking about Chechnya, whether we're talking about Ukraine 2014, the question of Crimea, whether we're talking, for example, about the Syrian operation, and for example, the example, say, of Aleppo. Um, and I think in this regard, um, I would suggest that there was a culmination of sort of successes that the regime saw in the past of Russia being able to use this war and conflict in order to both bolster its position internationally, but also domestically, which is perhaps one of the reasons why they thought that a quick victory at this point in time, as Ukraine was rearming itself, would sort of bring certain both political, military, and security gains. Now, in practice, as we know, of course, the Ukrainian resistance has been, um, you know, surprised many uh, military analysts and Western governments, but has been very significant. And therefore, what we now have is much more of a sort of um, a war of attrition. And as has been announced last week, you know, Russians moving away from having this sort of a three-pronged approach of trying to take over different parts of Ukraine in the north, the south, and the east, potentially now recognizing their inability of creating sort of a form of regime change in Kyiv and focusing much more on their operations in Donbass. Although on the ground, we haven't automatically seen that shift yet. But what can we say about the war sort of in conflict already a month on? One of the things I think that we will be continuing to discuss in the way in which um, this campaign is quite different from what we saw in 2014, not only because we don't, you know, because the international community has sort of not rolled over and accepted um, the Putin regime's position and sort of the talk of, you know, Ukraine not being allowed to exist, etc., like they had done when it comes to Crimea in 2014. But we also have, I would say, a reversal insofar as the Russian um, regime is actually waging what we could say is a much more traditional type of military campaign on the ground in Ukraine. And unlike, for example, um, the questions of hybrid warfare back in 2014, we actually have a much more complex picture when it comes to the pushback 
um, both militarily on the ground with regards to the Ukrainian side, but also, for example, with the Western reaction to the conflict itself. And in that regard, for example, you know, we have the power played by um, not only the use of sort of um, the local population, sort of the civilian um, population in Ukraine is sort of pushing back the successes of the Ukrainian uh, military that others will talk about um, today, but also, for example, the extraordinary level of digital diplomacy that has been shown and demonstrated by President Zelensky and the power of sort of digital diplomacy in war and conflict. We also have, for example, the focus, um, particularly by uh, the US and the EU, in the development of sort of um, economic warfare, as um, has been called by some analysts, but also has been sort of turned by the Russians, in trying to create um, global pressure on Putin, but also on Russia, in sort of trying to exclude them from the global economy. And so what we have in that sense is an attempt by the West, for example, to um, keep local, the military operations on the ground in Ukraine, whilst creating sort of a global front against Russia in trying to create increased pressure. And in that sense, we therefore have a reversal of a much more sort of modern, much more complex front that is being pushed back against Russia and a much more conventional military um, strategy on the part of President Putin. Now, um, you know, at this stage, of course, one month into the conflict, we no longer think of this conflict ending in a matter of days. We're now looking at a sort of more long-term questions of months. Um, I think most analysts still agree that the end of the um, war will still probably be through the sort of diplomatic negotiations. But I think already a month in, we can make and draw certain conclusions about the sort of this particular type of uh, war, particular type of conflict that we have seen since the end of February. And I will stop at this point um, because I think I have overrun my five minutes. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Aglaya. Uh, really great uh, kickoff to our discussion. Uh, for the other panellists, I will raise my hand and send you a message when you have a minute left of your five minutes, just so that we do keep to time, because I realise there are lots of speakers. The, the goal is to have bursts from each of us. Um, I realise we've got lots uh, to say, but I think for the first speaker, Aglaya, you, you've provided the foundation, uh, which is excellent. So, Pete, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, Putin's aims uh, in this war. And uh, really, there are two main aims he had. First of all, is connected with Russia's overall security, um, NATO enlargement that's gone on from 1949, 19, 1999, and the, um, uh, what he was talking about, rolling it all back to what it had been since then, before then. Um, as far as I can see, this was simply a negotiating position. It was never serious and it was quite abandoned. The real issue is, is uh, the real aim is precisely about Ukraine, specifically about Ukraine, uh, because Putin wants to punish Ukraine for twice uh, rejecting um, a president who'd been favoured by Putin. First of all, in the Orange Revolution, uh, which was uh, when the people of Ukraine revolted against uh, the fraudulent elections, which would have made U Yanukovych president. And electoral fraud is precisely how Putin, one of the reasons how Putin himself maintains him, himself in power inside Russia. And secondly, Putin wanted to punish uh, uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian people for the Maidan. Um, again, a revolution against Yanukovych, his time in power, um, so Ukraine was clearly choosing democracy rather than authoritarianism. And this Ukrainian model of an Eastern Slavonic state, uh, which was capable of both developing democracy and then from that uh, uh, beginning to fight corruption, would uh, be very dangerous for Putin if it was, if it was copied by, by people inside Russia is the idea that people inside Russia could change governments by elections. Um, and uh, so at the same time as, uh, uh, as this, Putin has been cracking down on uh, opposition inside Russia, greater oppression, more censorship, 
closing down whatever independent media there was. Um, and the thing is that Putin does believe, I think, that Ukrainians and Russians really are one people. He's said this several times. He's said this for, uh, for nine years now. Um, and I think he believes it. Um, and so anyone in Ukraine who's opposing this, disagreeing with, with Putin, is a traitor and should be eliminated. So what Putin wanted to do was to install a puppet government in Kiev, probably, I think, headed by Yanukovych, and then try and repress um, the, uh, any sort of independent culture, any sort of political opposition, with the help of, uh, of Russian forces. And uh, because of the uh, misinformation, disinformation he was getting from his advisors, advisors who were frightened to tell him the truth, um, he believed that he could, he could really do this. On the timing of the, uh, of the war, um, this supplements what Aglaus just said, um, he, he saw that time was running out as Ukraine was rearming. And as Aglaus said, adding uh, more and more Western weapons, missiles in particular. But also uh, Lukashenko uh, was becoming increasingly dependent on Putin inside Belarus. And um, after the fraudulent elections in 2020, when uh, Putin had sent support to Lukashenko, and with the new agreements that were reached over the last few months, it became possible for Putin to, to use Belarus um, as a staging point to uh, carry out a quick march from Belarus to Kiev, as he thought it, as he thought it would be, with much of the um, Ukrainian army being in, in the Donbass. So people were expecting really that the Russians would attack primarily in the Donbass, uh, which, uh, Although that's, but the, because that's well defended, um, Putin could see a faster route to getting into power. Uh, sorry, getting into into Ukraine and imposing his will. Just one final point: the real danger now, I think, is that the West pushes Zelensky into making concessions to the Russians. This talk of uh, neutrality, and I would say that any gain for Putin is going to strengthen him politically and militarily, both at home and abroad, and whet his appetite for more adventurism, which could conceivably in the future involve directly with NATO members. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Pete. Let's now move on to Dave Dalton. Dave. Thank you, Ben. Um, my name's David Dalton. I'm, as Ben said, I've recently finished a PhD on the Ukrainian oligarchy. How basically it's about how it reproduces itself as a political economy regime through certain habitual political and economic practices and the economic side effects of this, which are essentially sets up a feed, but negative feedback loop of a weak state and low investment. And that helps to explain why Ukraine has done so poorly economically over in the post-communist period. So my research fits into um, an understanding of the war in two ways, sort of at the beginning, and at the end. So at the beginning, it fits into um, alternative explanations of why the war started. So we've seen some, the, the, the most obvious one is that people put forward is uh, the NATO expansion. A second one, as we've touched on, is um, poor historiography or in imperialist ideology, as you might say. A third one that my, my, um, my subject ties in with is a geo-economic explanation, which I saw um, most recently in a paper by Sam Green from King's, and it's that um, joining the EU for Ukraine was a threat to um, Russia's own political and economic model. And this, is, this was resonant with me because I, um, first of all, the connection between the Ukrainian oligarchy and the Russian oligarchy, you can see completely straightforwardly in uh, the gas trade. The, the most straightforward link is through the gas trade, where Gazprom would um, link up with elements inside of the, 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 the Ukrainian elite, and that would, that's what we call, they would make their external rents through um, various schemes. And that's one of the main formative elements around which the material basis and the 
competition of the Ukrainian oligarchy formed itself since the late 1990s. But with the war, which as in this alternative explanation, this geo-economic explanation, is started not by security or geopolitical threat, but mainly by a threat of a DCFTA with the EU, which is a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. Um, and that's what finally we see on the ground forces Russia into using force in, in taking over Crimea. So this is, I wouldn't say this is the only explanation. It doesn't rule out the others, but I think it feeds into the others as part of an overall picture, because something of this scale doesn't happen through one cause. And I think it's the sort of thing that CIS is good at producing historical, detailed insider accounts, multiple um, account, um, factual accounts that sort of go against the ones that you see in the in the popular press, the more abstract ones, which are um, power politics or on the one hand of, of the right and sometimes neoliberalism is the explanation. Whereas in fact, the stuff that we do explains it more concretely and more, um, more believably, I think, from the inside. So that's where my, my stuff feeds in from there. And from the end point, what I had hoped was that my explanation of why the oligarch or the Ukrainian oligarchy keeps going, which is my explanation is it keeps going through habit, through shared institutionalized habit, that this will help at the other end during the post-war re reconstruction and reform, because it will help to explain why the traditional reforms, either from the outside, governance reforms from the outside or the internal de-oligarchization reforms, why they don't work because they don't conceive it as um, separately informed with this shared logic of the in, internal logic of the actors. And I hope that once this is over, my study will help to inform the policies that will be required, which the war has underlined, that governance reforms of political and economic governance will be desperately needed in order to assure Ukraine's long-term survival. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. I'm going to take most of the questions at the end, but I see that there's one from Leanne Curran uh, asking whether your PhD is already publicly available to read. Uh, so feel free to respond to that, Dave. Um, once it's um, gone through the corrections, email me and I'll send you a PDF. There we go. And we'll all look forward to reading the book, which I imagine you'll be producing swiftly as well. We'll do, hopefully, as quickly as possible. Fantastic. Thanks, Dave. Let's move on now to Bogdana uh, Kurila to tell us about her thoughts regarding the invasion and the ongoing war. Bogdana, over to you. Thanks, Ben. And hello, everyone. Um, so, well, my research focuses on how Ukrainian society has operated as a security actor. And I think it won't be an exaggeration to say that the success of Ukrainian resistance right now has a lot to do with the self-organization of Ukrainian society. Um, Ukrainians have a history of uniting across communities, regions and class divides in times of crisis. And the larger the scope of emergency, the stronger civil society becomes. And right now we see that Ukraine's survival is literally at stake. And therefore there are millions of Ukrainians volunteering and taking care of each other. These are ordinary people that are doing things that may seem small, but are extraordinary because of how they all together contribute to, to the collective effort. Um, so what are the ways in which Ukrainian society has participated in the country's defense uh, outside of the army, of course. Uh, well, so first of all, we see ordinary citizens joining territorial defense forces and roughly 100,000 100, uh, territorial defense troops were enlisted in Ukraine within the first 10 days of the war. Um, secondly, there are also various groups that support the Ukrainian armed forces by um, helping to purchase military equipment and providing um, aid to hospitals. Um, and an even, even larger number of groups are providing humanitarian assistance uh, all, all around Ukraine. In many cases, they consist of local residents who have taken matters in their own hands, seizing the initiative to uh, maintain basic services disrupted by the war. Um, and, uh, you know, on this messenger, 
or uh, WhatsApp, Telegram um, apps, you see a lot of people who are making um, spontaneous connections, asking things like uh, um, who needs diapers or <clears throat> whose pets need to be fed in that area or in that area. <clears throat> and so at the same time, we, when I interview these agents, I hear from them that they perceive international NGOs and, you know, uh, yeah, mostly interna international NGOs to be quite impotent in this situation. Um, and that there is a lack of coordinated international aid effort covering the, the whole of Ukraine. Um, unfortunately, most of international organizations do not operate within Ukraine and they actually bring supplies to the Polish border and they leave them there. So it is then small society groups in Ukraine that have to transport food and medical supplies to local populations. And of course they risk their lives while doing that. Um, finally, there are also grassroots pro protests taking, uh, taking place in Russian occupied cities. And despite being at gunpoint, Ukrainians peacefully protest and try to even try to stop Russian tanks with their bare hands. So it's, uh, yeah, and in some places it was completely unexpected um, because, because of low levels of uh, suicide activity there before the current uh, large scale war. Um, so what could explain the strengths of civil society today? Um, my answer would of course be to look at the revolution of 2014, which gave birth to a new civil society in Ukraine. And the concern with security was present even then, because we, we saw people establishing, you know, hospitals right on the Maidan Square and uh, building defenses against the police. Uh, so this idea of security, security making was already happening then. Um, <clears throat> But of course, between the Maidan Revolution in 2014 and now, so society was not dormant. Over the past eight years, Ukrainians have learned to live and function in conditions of emergency. Um, so the threat of a full-scale Russian invasion has been omnipresent throughout this time, and it didn't come as a surprise. Um, I also research, I also investigate in my research what security means to these local agents. So what are they fighting for uh, in simple terms? And the obvious answer that may come, um, that we may think of is that they're fighting for the survival of the state. Uh, but when I interview these groups, I also hear that the war is not so much about, you know, securing the state or territories or borders, but it's first and, uh, and foremost understood to be about securing democracy and freedom. Um, as, as one of the options. So it's also, it's about emancipating from Russia's control. Uh, a safe country is one that is free. That's what I hear from them. Um, and for that, Ukrainians are very much ready to die. Of course, many of them also say that we are fighting for our, uh, our friends, for our family. You know, there is a lot of personal connection. Um, and finally, the war is seen to be about the right to, uh, the right to be Ukrainian. And these agents are fighting against the idea of being, you know, Russia's little sister. Uh, so it also has a lot to do with securing the identity. And it is precisely the capacity for citizen agency that is one of the key elements that distinguishes uh, Ukraine from Russia in the eyes of these uh, agents. To these groups, Kremlin's threats to kill Zelensky do not make sense because they appear as the remnants of a med medieval mindset. Uh, what Putin doesn't re realize is that the removal of Zelensky will not cause the country to collapse as millions of citizens will go on resisting and perhaps will show even more, a stronger resistance. So my conclusion is that the current emergency has signified the emergence of a new Ukraine that's even more united than before and in which citizens see themselves as directly responsible for, for the security of their country. Uh, yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Magdana. Let's now move on to Dr. Neshka Kubal, who will speak to us about the refugee crisis. Also part of this block, uh, we intended to have Ada Wordsworth to speak to us from the Polish-Ukrainian border. I see that Ada isn't on the Zoom call at the moment. 
Um, so it might not be that we get that insight from what's happening on the ground. Uh, if not, that's not disastrous. It also might be that Michal and Ada join us slightly later. But without further ado, let me hand over to Agnieszka. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, I just thought I will share with you this uh, small map because talking about refugees uh, without the uh, visualization can be a bit uh, blurry because the numbers will just go all over the place. In that sense, you see the map. It's the it's not my doing. It's the recent data from the UNHCR, which demonstrates that indeed this is one of the if not the most unprecedented uh, migration and refugee crisis Europe has seen since the Second World War. In my five minutes, I want to focus on three points. Apart from presenting the numbers and estimates, I want to focus on the legal solutions that have been put in place uh, in the EU. Uh, and three, I want to give a very few sociological characteristics of those movements that we see at the moment. So starting from the numbers, uh, there are around 3.8 million of international refugees from Ukraine that we have seen uh, leaving Ukraine and crossing the borders internationally as a result of the Russian invasion. Majority of them crossed the border to Poland, 2.3 million, which is around 4% of the Polish population. However, I, if we look at the number of refugees per capita, I would like to point out to the little Moldova, who at the moment has taken more than 13% uh, of its population uh, uh, as Ukrainian refugees. The uh, majority also crossed to Romania, Hungary and Slovakia. But as the uh, international experts are saying, and here I will rely on the estimate of uh, Professor Maciej Dostek from Warsaw, uh, the refugees are not necessarily staying in this, uh, uh, in this country. So Poland, for instance, at the moment has an estimated more or less 1.3, 1.4 million of refugees because they are moving forward to the West. And that is, so there are, uh, so the orange numbers you see are estimates uh, around 250,000 in Germany, 270,000 in the Czech Republic, 25,000 in Austria, 30,000 in France, but also around 80,000 in Spain, uh, 20,000 in Finland. As of the UK is, is concerned, we have uh, 12,000 applications that have been approved by the Home Office. We do not know how many people are actually physically in the UK at the moment. Uh, with regard, to, so you can see that uh, with these numbers that we also see a mobility of refugees within the EU because in contrast to uh, an event that has been termed the most recent refugee crisis, and I'm using a quote unquote, because in comparison to the, uh, to the current numbers uh, over uh, in 2015, as in the aftermath of the Syrian uh, war, we had over one year, 1.3 million applications for asylum, a ballpark figure, 1.3 million applications for asylum. Here in the last three weeks, we have 3.8 million refugees already. So uh, the academics like to, policymakers likes to overuse the word crisis, but I would say perhaps now it's the right time to do so. Uh, the 2015 in comparison, I would say, if it was a crisis, it was a crisis of European administration, where a European Union as a block of 600 million people could not accept 1.3 million uh, refugees from the Middle East and uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm gonna, uh, so this is as far as the numbers are concerned. Uh, there are also more than 10 million people that have been displaced within Ukraine as a result of the conflict. And that's this figure here, uh, IDPs, internally displaced people. And some were prevented from leaving, for instance, because of the, uh, uh, because of the cities being under open fire. 
Uh, in contrast to 2015, EU put in place, uh, uh, I would say, a very good way of accommodating the refugees, and that's a temporary protection directive mechanism. It was put in place as an aftermath of the um, uh, conflicts in the Balkans in 1990s, as a way to collectively accommodate for a large number of refugees displaced due to the war, which gives the people access to the labor market, healthcare, education, welfare system, and a, a legal residence for a one year with the possibility of extension. What about sociological characteristics? Well, I would say I agree with um, many experts which say that this is still very much the reception of refugees in particularly the Eastern Europe, uh, but also in the West is very much a volunteer based humanitarianism. Anna Ratecka in the Border Criminologist blog at Oxford called it a festival of help, where really everyday people come up with offer of flats, uh, accommodation, um, uh, short-term support. Uh, the reason, of course, is that uh, this is an unprecedented aggression of Russia on Ukraine. It's a war. At the same time, we see that the gender and age characteristics of people who are leaving Ukraine due to the mobilization, for instance, within Ukraine are very closely aligned with what discursively has been imagined as the ideal refugee. So primarily we see women with small children, uh, which again, I would say could be take, as a sociological characteristic could be taken into account why the response to this refugee crisis is so different than what we have seen in 2015. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Agnieszka. Given that Ada and Michal aren't on the call, I suggest we move straight to Dr. William Blacker. William, over to you. Uh, thanks a lot, Ben. Um, so I'm going to say a few words about um, language and history, um, two things that are kind of close to my own research, I, I research cultural memory and also um, uh, questions of multicultural and multilingual culture in Ukraine. Um, and these have been things that have been very much at the heart of a lot of the rhetoric around the war. Um, so obviously Putin started off talking about denazification, protecting Russian speakers, um, using uh, these kind of imperialist readings of um, Ukrainian history to paint his aggression as some kind of, uh, so sort of fulfilling some kind of historical justice. Um, and these are things that have generated a lot of uh, discussion, uh, especially in Western media. Um, Western media asking questions, where are the Nazis? Um, are Russia and Ukraine just the same thing as Putin says? Uh, I think a lot of Ukrainians are really fed up uh, listening to these questions. Um, a lot of the, the Western coverage has focused on discrediting these ideas, you know, to be fair. But I would say even that process of discrediting shows a certain degree of success for Russia in dictating the kind of talking points uh, to the Western media and distracting attention from, from other maybe more important things, uh, at least in the first stage of the war. Uh, inside Ukraine, obviously I'm not there, so I, I don't know kind of what people are saying on the ground, but as far as I can judge from media, from contacts, from social media, I don't think people are talking a lot about these problems. Um, we have millions of Russian speakers from the East and South now in the Ukrainian speaking West. Um, and the overwhelming impression, I think, is one of solidarity and mutual support and this kind of self-organization that uh, Bogdan talked about. Um, the question of kind of the Nazis in Ukraine, I think, is treated sort of as a little bit like a running joke. Um, but the, the rhetoric is there on, on a kind of vernacular sort of level. So comparisons of, of Putin to Hitler are obviously very common, but uh, you know, I noticed it also became quite common in, in kind of ordinary media discourse to, to call the Russian invading forces fascists um, without any sense that it's in some way kind of an exaggeration. Um, I don't see a lot of serious kind of engagement with Putin's historical series inside Ukraine. I think um, people are just because people feel these things are not really worth engaging with and they have other priorities. Um, Zelensky, it's been kind of interesting to follow what Zelensky has been saying about these things. Um, I think a lot of what he said about 
questions of culture and identity and history and language have been for external audiences, because he knows that the, you know, the, his Ukrainian audience is interested in other problems, more pressing problems. Um, he, in the interview with Russian journalists uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, the day before, um, he did speak about this, but basically just to call for an end to Russian manipulation and speculation on the question of Russian language in Ukraine. Um, he mentioned it also in relation to Hungary, interestingly. Um, and he said so it was very clear that nobody is banning the Russian language in Ukraine. Um, but he did make the point which um, uh, that many Ukrainians, including those who generally spoke, spoke Russian uh, or were very kind of, uh, let's say, positively disposed towards Russian culture, um, now feel increasingly alienated from the language and from the culture. Uh, and I think it's too early to say what the effect is going to be, but I've certainly anecdotally, I've, this is what I'm hearing and the impression that I'm getting. Um, the, on the memory politics, it's been also interesting to observe what, how Zelensky has been tailoring his historical references to international audiences. So um, he, it's not, it, he's not one for, who goes in for memory politics in a big way, actually, but he has been using it. You know, so he's talked about Churchill in the UK Parliament, he talked about Martin Luther King to the Americans. Um, but these things can be complicated and difficult. You know, so, for example, mentioning Pearl Harbor to the Americans apparently that upset some people in Japan. Um, he, the Second World War and the Holocaust in particular has been kind of interesting to observe. Uh, he doesn't talk an awful lot about his Jewishness and about his family's uh, suffering in the Holocaust, but he has started to talk about the Holocaust more generally. Um, following that pattern of tailoring his, his um, references to audiences, when he spoke to the Israeli Knesset, Obviously, he spoke about the Holocaust. He compared the Russian invasion of Ukraine to the Holocaust. Uh, and that, the way he spoke about it, received mixed responses. You know, for example, he suggests that Israelis should behave towards Ukrainians as Ukrainians did towards Jews during World War II. And what he meant was that there were many Ukrainians who rescued Jews during the war. But for many of those listening in Israel, they help is not the first association they have when they think of Ukrainians' role in the Holocaust. Um, so that, I think, fell a bit flat, but he did get away with it, um, I think. And even those who sort of found his, his words on that kind of offensive still expressed support for Ukraine. Um, although like, so the question of Israel's uh, kind of ambivalence in a lot of questions, such as military support and sanctions, is, uh, is definitely uh, still there. But rhetorical support, for sure. Um, a more effective reference, I think, was the way he used... The, he referred to the Holocaust Memorial in Budapest when he talked, when he kind of spoke about Viktor Orban, when he was talking to, about different European leaders and, and how they supported or not supported Ukraine, which I think riled Orban. Uh, Orban maybe not such a bad thing to do, um, but also I think kind of appealed to a, a, a European liberal, liberal audience. Um, so in that sense, I think just to finish off, Zelensky is. Um, He's not overdoing it with the memory politics. I think generally he's getting it right. He keeps it in perspective, but um, I think he's sometimes, he needs to be a little bit more cautious uh, and sensitive with that. Brilliant, thanks for that, William. Before we move on to our final speaker, I should say that those panelists who see questions in the Q&A box that they can answer by typing their answer, please do follow the example of Agnieszka and, and respond to those questions. Other members of the audience will be able to see the answer, so it's not as if the response is private and you'll see the answer in the um, helpfully named answered section of the Q&A box. So panelists, if you feel you can answer those questions while still, of course, listening to our final speaker, then, then please please do. So without further ado, Ursula, over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ben. I'm going to talk very briefly about three things. Firstly, about my research. Secondly, about the current invasion. And thirdly, about uh, the implications for public debate and academic debate uh, of the invasion, which uh, all of us I know, probably including uh, audience here to are grappling with in one way or another. So firstly, my research, which has been about how different individual 
uh, specialists and political actors in different cities in Ukraine since about 2012 have been trying to respond to the Russian government history propaganda, which has been obviously very evident to lots more people uh, in the last uh, month or so, but has been going on in one way or another for a very long time in Ukraine. You could argue for centuries, or you could argue since 2005, there are lots of different places to draw the line. And one of the things that characterizes these interventions by whether it's local politicians or local museum curators or indeed local academics is uh, a consciousness of uh, taking the sting out of identity politics and othering and politicization. And, and it's really fascinating to see how that works. Uh, I intentionally took an area studies led approach to my research. I wanted to write about something which I thought characterized the relationship between Ukraine and Russia and what it uh, shows about how that relationship works during a good period and perhaps doesn't work during a period uh, like the one we're living through at the moment. People have often said to me, are you writing about culture then? Are you writing about history? And I say, actually, I'm not. I think I'm writing about politics because I think this is so essential to how power is currently distributed between these two countries and how, uh, how that power is shifting. Secondly, on to the uh, current invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation. Uh, William and other speakers have uh, mentioned how the uh, Kremlin information wraparound, narrative wraparound to the military invasion uh, consisted of three fronts or ideas notionally relating to three fronts. So there was history, uh, if you'll take the idea that uh, Ukrainians and Russians are historically the same people. There was notional politics, if you'll take the idea that denazification is real. And there was uh, language, if you'll um, take the idea that this is as a, an ongoing genocide of uh, Russian speakers in Ukraine. So ideas and narrative, not reality, but really central. And what is fascinating about how important both to this current uh, administration in Russia and indeed historically there are plenty of people on the panel particularly uh, Pete Duncan who would tell you a lot more about this how important uh, political narrative and political communication is as an instrument of Russian political power both domestically and internationally uh, really particularly so so uh, who is leading the uh, Russian uh, negotiations with Ukraine at the moment, or has been, we'll see if he's still there tomorrow when they meet again in Turkey. It's Vladimir Medinsky, who is, was until January 2020, the Russian Minister of Culture, who was Russian Minister of Culture for a long time, from I think 2012 to the beginning of 2020, when he became an advisor to President Putin, and whose uh, long career uh, as the Russian Minister of Culture is worth taking a look at in terms of the things he said and the things he did uh, to do with promoting uh, narrative over reality and consolidating informational power and power over ideas and power over the interpretation of ideas in Russia. So. Uh, what do we see as a result of him uh, leading the peace talks or so-called peace talks from the Russian side? Uh, I think I only see that with um, the Russian political system in this configuration, in this state, that uh, control of narrative and control of interpretation, whether that's for us, for Western audiences or for audiences at home, uh, remains one of the most important things for the current Kremlin. Do we see that if he's given the right narrative off ramp, there's a chance of that? I don't think I would go that far, but if you were very optimistic, you might. So that's on the current invasion. Thirdly, and this is to broaden things out very briefly, the implications for public debate and academic debate 
uh, for all of us as a result of this invasion, which I think are huge and which we're all coming to terms with. And I know that in a sense, I'm lucky because I've been coming to terms with them for longer than a number of people. Um, but that I think despite the difficulties today, the difficulties in our academic community and the difficulties in our international academic community also, the chance that this gives us to reconsider our work and to reconsider the value of our work and to reconsider the value of our contribution to public discourse is huge. And I also think given the suffering in the place that we're looking at, the places that we're looking at today, uh, perhaps a kind of social responsibility in our part as well. So I think that's something for us to bear in mind um, as we go forward with this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ursula. And I see that Ada and Michal have just been able to join us from the Polish-Ukrainian border. Fantastic. Now, we have gone slightly over the apportioned 45 minutes, but I don't want to turn down the opportunity to hear from Ada and Michal. I would uh, again draw the attention of the audience to the fact that lots of the questions are being answered by the panellists in the Q&A box. So hopefully that's a hybrid way in which we can hear from our two additional panellists, but also your answers, your sorry, your questions will be answered in the box. And hopefully we will have time for um, Q&A as well after Ada and Michal have spoken spoken. So uh, Ada, if you want to go first to give us a sense of what you've been doing on the border, that would be fantastic. Hi, um, so I have been at the Przemysl border, which is the, by Medica, which is the biggest, biggest border crossing for the past two weeks now. Um, the situation has changed quite a lot in the past two weeks, just in terms of one, the fact that the refugees who are coming over now are now incredibly traumatised whereas two weeks ago people were coming over kind of preemptively whereas now we're actually seeing people from Mariupol from Kharkiv um, who are coming having you know seen their towns be destroyed um, there's also a situation here where increasingly we have people coming through this border point to go back um, and many people are now choosing to return to Ukraine um, for a number of reasons some of them always planned to go back and just wanted to drop their children or their parents off in Europe and make sure they got here and then return. But um, for a lot of people, there's also the issue that they've sort of arrived in Poland and realized that the situation here isn't that they're being given housing and jobs and they're going to kind of be looked after here. And the situation is actually that they're being put into camps um, and they are sleeping in a room with 100 people with screaming babies and there is no sort of movement outside it. There's no sort of trajectory by which they can move away from this if they want to stay in Poland. And for most people, they do want to stay in Poland or they want to stay somewhere close to Ukraine. Um, and so, you know, we have people coming here from the UK, from France, who want to help people get to these places. But on the whole, people don't want to go that far away from their family. They want to be able to return to Ukraine at a moment's notice as and when they are needed or as and when the war ends. Um, and so my, two weeks ago, it was ushering people into this kind of new land of hope. It now feels like increasingly people are coming here traumatized and broken by what they've seen. And then I'll see them a few days later saying, you know, actually, I'm going to go back to Kharkiv because I would rather be there supporting my family than I would be here living in a camp where everyone has COVID, everyone has norovirus, everyone has life and I'm being treated like nothing. Um, so yeah, the situation is basically very fluid, but that's what I'd say my impression of the past two days has been that it has been about uh, yesterday, there was one platform of people going back to Ukraine and one platform of people arriving from Ukraine and they were equally full. Um, and so the situation I think is more complex than perhaps it's being reported being in the UK um, because, and in the EU in general, because the EU wants to feel like it's doing a really good job welcoming everyone, but it's doing actually a bad enough job that people are choosing to return to an active war zone as opposed to staying in the accommodation provided for them by European states. 
Thank you very much for that incredibly important view from, from the ground, especially uh, when lots of us on this call are in London. So Ada, huge thanks for that. Uh, Michal, if you can uh, talk to us about the points that you suggested, so the impact on cities in Ukraine, but also other cultural factors, that would be brilliant. And I'll slow down speaking while you can put your earphones in and then hopefully you're ready to go now yes hi everyone i managed to i take i i, I have put my earphones in so sorry that we joined in a little bit late i just got here ada's been here for a month uh so she's really very much uh experientially and uh theoretically analytically equipped to uh to reflect on um on what on what's happening here at the border which is uh which is obviously hard to comprehend from a distance but ada's ada's uh, your person on this and she's writing a bunch of articles and I highly recommend also Ada's Substack, which you can find if you Google Ada Wordsworth Substack. And there's great, um, there's really, really deeply instructive reflections there from her about what the situation in the border, on the border actually looks like and the, men, and the many pathologies, as well as the kind of more hoped for dimensions of that situation. But I wanted to just very briefly uh, share a couple of reflections uh, from um, sort of my line of work, which is more about architecture, political aesthetics, public culture. Um, I, I hate to start with, uh, with Vladimir Putin, uh, who is probably somebody we should not be seeking to foreground or center in, in these discussions. But um, he's many, um, he, Putin has made many extremely bizarre declarations over the course of the last few months. And one of his most bizarre speeches and declarations, and one of those ones that resonated most to me and kind of resonated with my also in, in a very disturbing way with my, way with my work was, uh, I think it was in the final days of February. This is a, uh, a speech of Putin's uh, that was, um, I was made aware of by my PhD student, Makar Teryoshin. Uh, and this was a posthumous award, a, a speech uh, connected to a posthumous award that Putin made to a lack soldier from the Caucasus who died in the, um, who died in Ukraine, who died in the, um, in the course of his, in the course of his service in Ukraine and um, awarding this posthumous award, I was going to check the name of the soldier, but I, but I, but I didn't, awarding, I didn't have time, awarding this posthumous award to, to the soldier, put him, Putin put himself forward as this kind of really terrifying, disturbing, bizarre, sovereign personification of the centripetal kind of imperial diversity of Russia in one person, and in particular as this kind of personalized microcosm of Russia's war. So he said that where, while I may be a Russian from Ivan and Maria, in, in, in this moment, I am a Lak, I am a Chechen, I am a Mordvin, I am a Jew, I am an Ingush, I am a Chechen. I think he even may have said one of the nationalities twice. So he really kind of, he, he really rendered this imperial sovereign embodiment of himself as the, as the center of the empire. In an extremely in, in an extremely kind of vivid and bizarre way and i've long been interested in the way that this kind of russian public culture public space and architecture revels in these kinds of centripetal condensations of russia's imperial diversity uh in particular i focus in my work on on moscow on architecture in moscow on the way in which park zariadie which is this hybrid american designed landscape park and multimedia attraction in the shadow of moscow's kremlin brings together the landscape zones uh, landscape typologies, flora, tundra, taiga, steppes, cuisines, and floral diversity of Russia together uh, in its design and its cultural program. And this is uh, put forward in uh, the context of the last 10 years or so of Moscow as a kind of progressive ecological nationalism, like a, a kind of different type of a more, a more modern nationalism than, than the Russian nationalism of old. So it's been extremely disturbing to see this, this logic a similar centripetal center gathering uh, diversity gathering logic which is materialized and built form in Zariadia and other projects replicated in this in this fascist openly fascist z imperial rule rhetoric of, of putin's war and it brings home the coloniality uh, of russia asserting not only attempting to assert its ownership and control over a neighboring state but it's colonial also in the sense that the russian state is sending its colonial proletarian subalterns to die and to be killed in uh, in Ukraine. Um, and there's just one other thing I wanted to mention. I organized together with uh, uh, 
uh, colleagues uh, from Goldsmith and Queen Mary, a symposium last weekend uh, on the topic uh, decolonizing Russia's war on Ukraine. Uh, I urge you to, to, to have a look at the YouTube recording of this symposium. I'll share it in the chat in a second. Uh, there were uh, uh, around 10, uh, 15 actually, mostly Ukrainian filmmakers, uh, intellectuals, um, artists who participated in the in the symposium, sharing their views on this sort of colonial on the, on the various colonial dimensions of of Russia's war on Ukraine. And one of the most disturbing things and difficult things about this symposium was it happened on Saturday, which was a day on the morning of which Russia had already bombed Babinyar, uh, the Holocaust memorial site in Kiev on the 1st of March. And on the 26th of March, it also bombed Drobitsky Yar, uh, which is another Holocaust memorial site in Kharkiv, and uh, destroyed, well, or damaged the menorah monument, uh, which is erected by a Kharkiv a Jewish architect on this site. And during the symposium, one of my uh, one of my friends who's from Kiev came up to me and showed me a photograph of this menorah destroyed, the place where her Jewish uh, family are buried or they, where they were killed uh, in, the, in, the, in the Holocaust, uh, in the shooting Holocaust that took place there. And then um, several, a couple, of, a couple of hours later, during the symposium as well, we received notification that the, that the bombardment of Lviv had taken place. And this, this same person has a flat in Lviv, her entire family in Lviv. So in the morning, her ancestors were bombarded. And in the, in the afternoon, her living family and her, uh, and her entire kind of life world were under threat. So this was, uh, and at this moment too, I was, I was texting with um, another symposium participant who is from Kharkiv and who's an architectural historian of Kharkiv and who will be coming to UCL almost certainly soon on, on one of the first UCL academic sanctuary fellowships. And she told me, but there is a phrase that her um, her mom kept using during, uh, or that she'd heard many people use, and I have heard other people using this phrase too, uh, other Ukrainian contacts using this phrase, um, especially those who are located in Kharkiv. The 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 front runs through us. The this literal declaration, the front the the front. We are in danger. We are under threat because the front runs through us, front idiot cheres nas. Uh, and there's a, uh, a famous quote from uh, Chicana um, intellectual uh, Gloria Anzaldúa, the, the border runs through me, which is a reference to, uh, to the way in which kind of American police uh, border regimes directly impact the lives of people. And it was particularly striking. One of the many kind of striking reflections from that day was to see this phrase by Anzaldúa echoed so so disturbingly by the um, uh, echoed so directly and disturbingly in and, and even in a more intense way in, in the real life of 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 of, uh, of our interlocutors at the symposium. So anyway, I could I could go on for for a long time, but this is this is enough now, especially since uh, we joined at the at the end of the day. But I think this this the the way in which this 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 war this attack and coloniality is playing out in both well, is destroying the fabric of, of Ukrainian cities and playing out also in Russian public culture and Russian political aesthetics is, uh, is, um, is, 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 is continues to be fascinating and, and disturbing. So I'll, st I'll stop there. Thanks, Michal. So a reminder again that lots of questions now have been answered in the Q&A box, but I have selected three questions to ask and I've got some idea about which panellists that I'm going to direct them to, but also panellists feel free to jump in if you want to chip in. So the first question relates to uh, Michal and Ada. It's from Paul Sims. And it's, uh, uh, Paul says, you mentioned uh, COVID-19, uh, norovirus and blight. Two questions, are COVID vaccines available where you are? And the second is, is typhoid a problem? That's a question from his brother and emergency registrar. So that's the first cluster of questions. The second cluster of questions relates to um, uh, what Pete said. So this is from Russia Chowdhury, a question for Pete Duncan. Uh, is there any possibility of Ukraine emerging with some sort of victory and avoiding further dismemberment 
dismemberment without making the kind of compromise with Russia, such as accepting a neutral status, which you argue should not be made. In the absence of such a compromise, will the war not go on indefinitely to the detriment of Ukraine's civilian population? So that's the second question, which is uh, directed at Pete. And then the third question might already have been answered while I was lining them up, which is absolutely fine. The answer will be in the answered section. So let me now turn to a question asked by uh, Lara Stanka, which uh, relates to misinformation provided to Putin by his advisors, making him believe that he could undertake this operation, that is the invasion of Ukraine, quickly and successfully. This is a question to any panelists who feels that they'd like to respond. Do you see a possibility of any significant fallouts occurring within the Kremlin's inner circle as a result of this quote unquote bad advice, leading to potential instability within the inner circle? Uh, uh, that, as in Putin blaming his close advisors for miscalculating the situation and this causing tensions or changes in policy. So they're the first three questions. If we can go to Paul's question first, Michal and Ada, do you have your responses to that please? Yeah, um, so there aren't COVID vaccines being provided here, um, which is definitely an issue because we have fewer than, I think it's fewer than a third of Ukrainians are vaccinated, if I think that's the correct statistic. Um, and, you know, I heard of a babushka a few days ago who some of my colleagues interpreters here spoke to who um, ended up catching COVID on her first night here and spending um, 10 days in hospital in Shemisal. And I'm sure that there are many other cases like that which we aren't hearing about. Um, but no, no, there aren't any vaccines being offered here, which I do think is a massive oversight by the medical authorities here. But they're also everything seems to be a bit of an oversight here generally. Um, Re-typhoid, I haven't specifically heard about that, but it could be an issue. Um, it's not one that I've come across. Thanks, Ada. Michal, anything to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm really, with regards to the second question, it's a great question. I'm not well equipped to answer that question. Like, I work on architecture, on public culture. I, I, I'm not an expert on the Caucasus. From what I understand from those friends and interlocutors who know more than I do about the Caucasus, there are tensions being reignited in Chechnya. There are Chechen soldiers fighting in Ukraine on both sides uh, of, of, of the war. Uh, but I'm really... Uh, I have heard other people make this claim confidently, but I can't confidently answer that question because I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not an expert on the on the on Chechnya or on the Thanks, Michal. So, Pete, over to you to answer the question from uh, Russia Chowdhury. Thank you, uh, Ben. Yes, this is a difficult question because I was saying that I didn't want. Uh, I thought a I didn't want to compromise. I thought the West was pushing Zelensky into a compromise. It's easy for me to say that because I'm not being bombed. I'm not fighting in the war myself. Um, but my concern, as I said, was that any compromise now will lead to more uh, demands from Putin in the future. Um, so the direct question was really whether Ukraine had a chance of winning the war. And I think Ukraine does have a chance of winning the war. Um, the uh, What is essential is um, much more help from the West, um, sending out those MiGs that have, I think are still in Poland, um, much more missile deliveries. You know, Zelensky said very clearly what, what kind of help he needs. And I think it's if the West gives him that sort of help, then we've seen the enthusiasm of the uh, of Ukrainian civil society, as uh, Bogdan was saying, with the, and we've seen the enthusiasm of, the, of the, the fighters themselves and the disorganization on the Russian side. Um, so I really think there's a chance of a Ukrainian victory. I'm not saying it's no. it's going to happen, but um, um, certainly a moral victory. Um, but uh, it actually leads me on when I'm looking for the thing that will most likely lead to a Ukrainian victory is in relation to Laura Steinker's question, um, which if I could leap in on that one, Ben, please, as well. Um, because what we have seen, um, uh, discontent at the... Uh, at the top, um, insofar as, I mean, most obviously perhaps we've seen uh, among the uh, Putin's circle, we've seen Chubais uh, leave for Turkey. But more importantly, in this context, it, we've seen the uh, FSB, inside the FSB, who are being blamed for 
now for giving the, the false information because they were too scared to give the true information in the first place. We've seen the head of the fifth department that's responsible for uh, work in post-Soviet states, in other words, in, inside Ukraine, and his deputy getting moves made against them because they're clearly not uh, they're clearly not happy with the way things are going. We've seen the arrest of the number two in the National Guard, uh, Roskvadia, on accusations of treachery. Um, we do, I don't know what that's about exactly. And there's no, we, I don't think anyone does outside the Kremlin, but um, it's an indication of, of discontent. And the armed forces, most importantly, um, they, they've lost, I think it's now seven, I may have lost count, but uh, major generals. Um, and remember, when the Minister of Defence and Garastam, chief of the general staff on television, um, uh, giving them orders to put the, the nuclear forces on alert, they didn't look at all happy. Um, what they should have done uh, straight away after getting an order from the commander in chief, uh, they sh should have said, Yeast, Tavarish Vyhovnik, Glavna Kamandushi. Yes, Supreme Commander in Chief, comrades, but the others will do it. They just sat there. Um, and um, they can see that they're now that their military assets are being destroyed. The Russian state is being is being crippled in in economic terms, and uh, uh, and it's they and remember that also the people in the, the leadership of the FSB and the armed forces they've got properties in the West that they're and they're being hit by the Western sanctions. So I think what could finally trigger a move against Putin if if he was to uh, instruct them to use chemical weapons, instruct the armed forces to use chemical weapons, or even more so if he asked them to use nuclear weapons, then I think they would just refuse to obey the order. And then they would have no alternative except to kill Putin, having disobeyed his order. Otherwise they themselves would get, would get killed. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Dave, I see you've raised your hand. Um, I just wanted to say that the two or three stories, one about the, the tyres, using Chinese tyres on their, on their military equipment, one about using a radio system they'd invested a billion dollars in, and another one about this FSB supposed to be bribing the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian political leadership, but they kept the money themselves. These are sort of tie in with what my earlier explanations, political economy, they thought that they could take the money instead of buying proper Goodyear tires, they bought Chinese tires. Instead of investing in a proper secure radio system, they kept the money. Instead of bribery, they kept the money. And this is the explanation that I've seen because they didn't think Putin was crazy enough to invade. They didn't think it was gonna happen. So, um, you know, this, this logic of the system rather than individual rationality, I think is, is 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 part of it and this will set off some things at the top and as we know in theories of revolution splits in the elite are essential the splits in the elite joining up with popular grievances with the russian economies set to fall between 10 and 20 percent this year depending on whose forecasts you believe possibly if it lasts long going back to what it was in 1991 because the russian economy has only grown by 30 percent in 30 years so this, the, we, we need to look up at the join-ups of the factors that could lead to his downfall, I think. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Aglaya, your hand was up, but then went down. Did you want to come in? I, mean, I can um, quickly chip into a couple of the questions. In terms of sort of the, you know, are we seeing any sort of ripple effect from what's going on in Ukraine elsewhere in terms of security? We haven't seen anything in Chechnya. Um, there are two sides of Chechens currently fighting in Ukraine. The sort of Kadyrov city, who seem to be make, mainly doing it for show. Um, and you do have the Chechen um, troops on the side of the Ukrainians who actually are seemingly taking part in real fighting. Um, the Kadyrov troops seem to just take videos and look very clean when they are um, inspecting the uh, vehicles. But what we are seeing, for example, is the ripple effect of and the impact of the Russian um, regime bringing in the forces from elsewhere. So the regime is bringing reinforcements from you know, um, the Far East, the South and the North. And so we have had um, pushback by those areas, for example, in Karabakh, because now that Russian attention is elsewhere, people are being, becoming to be concerned 
that sort of the Karabakh question might come back because obviously Armenian um, military is supported by the Russian forces. Um, so we are seeing that there was also a question in Central Asia, um, although at the moment there are no major security um, concerns around Tajikistan, for example, that was people were talking about a couple of weeks ago. So it is something to look out for. Um, and of course, I mean, not that anyone's invading Russia, but it is interesting to see that the Russians are sort of focusing their military operations on Ukraine as we speak with effects elsewhere. Um, but in terms of, for example, questions of partitions and the negotiation, I mean, I think the Russians have moved away from the discussions of regime change. They dropped that within the first two weeks of the war. Um, the focus does seem to be primarily on um, questions of the Abbasid Crimea and NATO. So in terms of there was a question about the EU, that was a mooted point as to whether or not the Russians would put the membership of the EU um, as one of the red lines, but they don't seem to have done. So whilst NATO is a red line for the Russian regime, um, EU doesn't seem to be, which is interesting seeing as the EU has in part acted as a security actor over this crisis. So the EU is no longer, well, it hasn't been for a while, but effectively has stopped being primarily an economic, political and social actor. It has developed a bit more of a security sort of forward um, defense um, sort of practices um, recently. Yeah, that's. Thank you very much, Aglaya. We have about nine minutes, eight, nine, nine minutes left. So what I'm going to do is ask a few of the panelists who haven't uh, uh, been asked questions, haven't responded to questions live, they might have typed them, but I haven't seen that yet, to give a sense to us quickly about things that they're going to be looking at, focusing on going forward, and that hopefully that might help the audience in navigating uh, at this situation as it continues to unfold. So Bogdana, I, I wonder whether you can give us a quick sense or when focusing on Ukrainian civil society, the types of things that you're going to be focusing on uh, moving forward. Thanks. Well, I'll be looking at uh, how, how the hustle society has changed over the past, you know, months compared to the previous eight years. So has there been a drastic change in, in the politics of civil society? For example, how have, has it become more um, about focusing on the enemy rather than focusing on preserving democracy within civil society and preserving the values of, uh, you know, freedom and so on. So it would become more existential as the stakes become much higher. Uh, I would also be looking at the different practices that have evolved um, over the past, you know, months, but also how moving forward. Um, so would some of the informal activities maintain their uh, richness and would there be as many activities or would uh, the activity of society decrease over time? Because uh, my sense is that the war will last uh, for longer than, you know, even a few months. Uh, yes, that's... Brilliant. Thank you very much, Magdana. Agnieszka, what are the things that are on the horizon that we should be paying attention to regarding the refugee crisis? Uh, well, I think primarily we need to consider the things that the civil society that is now taking the biggest hit or actually because it is a civil society run humanitarian help this will this is like the, this is risking to run out of steam unless it's properly supported by the government i also wanted to mention i i, I mentioned it already in a response to one of the questions from the audience that uh, poland and Hungary are currently embroiled in a big crisis with the EU conflict over the rule of law and uh, therefore no uh, money that were due for the sort of COVID post recovery was so far released to Poland because of the conditionality principle that has been invoked here. And as a result, I think that also stands in the way of any support being uh, of any financial support being moved to these two countries. Uh, we can argue that, again, there are different bureaucratic ways in which this could be bypassed, that the money could be moved directly to NGOs who are actually needing the money most and will you make the best use of it. They could be used, they could be moved instead of to the central government, they could be moved to local government, for instance, again, with a um, specific uh, 
um, conditions where this money should be spent for, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, checks and balances in place. But uh, as we know, uh, EU is a rather bureaucratic organization, so this is likely to take uh, to take uh, some time to decide which I think is the biggest issue at the moment because the civil society can be uh, running out of steam. Uh, I'm talking from personal experience here. My mom has five refugees in our small home in uh, west of Poland. And uh, yes, at the moment, uh, uh, I think the support from the neighbors, from everybody else is fantastic. There are local volunteers who, who organize this uh, um, uh, access to health, access to school, etc. But uh, without more sustained long-term support, again, we don't know how it's going to pan out. Thanks, Agnieszka. Ursula, what are you going to be looking at going forward? I'm going to be listening to what Medinsky has to say, and I'm going to be listening to what Putin has to say, and I'm going to be watching how different figures in Ukraine uh, respond asymmetrically, which they nearly always do. And when the war is over, I'm going to be watching, looking out for uh, which channels the Russian government in whatever state it's in by then is going to restart using to carry on on one front or another trying to uh, exert influence in Ukraine. Thanks, Ursula. Last but not least, William. What about you? Thanks, Ben. Uh, so I will definitely be looking at cultural development, uh, something I've been looking at for a few years already, the Ukrainian sort of culture of war, the literature, the drama, the poetry, the film. Um, and I would say, please take this, take these things seriously as, uh, you know, political scientists um, or, you know, whatever, whatever discipline or field you're in. Uh, because if you want to understand the experience of the situation of the war, uh, the sort of the psychological dimensions of it, various kind of nuances, whether it's to do with um, uh, you know the loss of home or um, reflections on language, all of these kind of things that you don't come across so much when you focus on the news coverage, which is about politics and geopolitics. And please. Uh, have a look. And if you're in London, for example, come to the Royal Court Theatre on Friday, where there'll be a couple of plays uh, being read about uh, about the war. Um, and in that, one of the big things also is the question of language, because what's been really fascinating is looking at how in Ukrainian literature, um, questions of the Russian language and bilingualism uh, have been reflected, and how, and how they are reflecting broader social and cultural shifts um, so I'll be very curious to see what happens now uh, in that front. And the, the whole question of the status of the Russian language, um, as for, for me, as seen through culture, is going to be something worth watching. Thanks for that, William. I should also say, for those who aren't aware, there is a web page of the CEASE website called CEASE on Ukraine, which gathers information not only on what the CEASE community is doing, for example, in terms of media engagement, but also provides further resources. So for those who aren't aware of that, if you just Google CEASE on Ukraine, that page should pop up. A huge thanks for that really rich discussion from our panelists, Dr. Aglaya Snetkov, Dr. Pete Duncan, Dr. Dave Dalton, Bogdana Kurila, Dr. Agnieszka Kubal, Ada Wordsworth, Dr. Michal Murawski, Dr. William Black and Ursula Woolley. Thanks also to the audience for your engagement and some excellent questions. This, as I said, is the second in a new series and we'll be advertising the third event very soon. So thank you everybody for joining. Have a good evening. Bye.